Jimmy, and thank you for joining me for our worship service today. Can I ask you a question? How many times in life does things happen to you? And you think, wow, that's luck, or, or that was a coincidence. But in all reality, it was an answer to prayer. You know, it was William Temple that said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. Sometimes where people see coincidences in life, really, they're seeing a miracle. You know, it was C.S. Lewis that wrote, miracles are the retelling of the smallest letters of the very same story that's written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. Can I say that again? You may have not caught that. C.S. Lewis said, miracles are the retelling in small letters of the very same story that's written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. You see, it's really easy in the world right now to lose sight of the bigger story, to lose sight of, of the large letters. And in doing so, I think we miss the miracles. We can let news stories grab us by the collar Headlines drag us underwater in the midst of all the 
Well, the crazy, sometimes the horrible news. I think sometimes we get spiritual amnesia. In other words, we forget that God has all the power and he's all merciful, and he's full of grace and truth, and he's always working behind the scenes to what? Rescue and redeem and restore and make things whole again. I think sometimes we lose sight of a God who shines a light in the darkness, no matter how dark the darkness gets. You see, the problem is, if we're not careful, we can become students of the darkness instead of children of the light. You see, when we say that anything is possible, what are we really talking about? I think we're talking about being people of faith, people of hope. Not just faith in faith, not just hope in hope, but I'm talking about faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and he is our hope. With him, anything is possible. You you know, that's just not a phrase that... Maybe we put on a banner in our church sometime, all things are possible with God. But literally, it comes from Scripture. You know, in those red letters in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 9, you know, one of my favorite places in churches, our church, uh, sometimes when I do camp meetings, revivals, maybe sometimes I'm doing a Christian conference, is what we call the altar, or sometimes I know at conferences they don't have altars, but places where they have, usually where we can come and meet with God. Those those are special places. Again, that's why we have altars. You know, over the years I have knelt with people there at that special place. I I have stood and and prayed with them, maybe anointed them uh, for healing. I've, I've, I've put my hands on couples that have been struggling, going through a a broken relationship. Again, I've wept there with parents who were brokenhearted over wayward children. You see, people that were hurting and struggling, sometimes people who had failed Christ have come to that space. And that space reminds me that with anything, God is possible. You know, I believe in life. We're going to go through all kinds of difficult times and moments. That's why we need faith. Because the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. You see, faith is believing that God exists. The Bible says he rewards those who diligently seek him. And faith is seeking God. It's coming to Jesus and bringing our doubts, our fears, and our disappointments. He can handle them. And saying, God, I'm going to trust you. Even though I don't know what you're kind of trying to do in this situation, even though I I can't see kind of down the road a little bit, I I don't know how you're going to work this out. God, right here in this moment, in this place, I want you to know I'm going to trust you. I'm going to hold on to you. I'm not going to let my present circumstances begin to write my theology. I believe in you, God. I believe that you have revealed yourself in your word. I believe you have revealed yourself through your son, Jesus Christ. And I even believe, God, you're using the Holy Spirit in my life. So I'm going to hold on to you, and I'm going to trust you. You see, my friend, that's faith. For most of the faith journey in our lives, they begin at that special place, that wonderful place where we say yes to Jesus, whether inviting him into our hearts as little kids or older people or saying yes to his will and his way. Can I say this real quickly? And it's important about the altar. You know, you don't have to come to a church building. You don't have to kneel specifically at an altar to talk to God or to say yes to God. I I remember hearing about C.S. Lewis, you know, that famous author. He said that he was riding on the back of his brother's motorcycle, actually, when he said yes to Jesus. Now, for me as a young kid, I was probably, again, I don't know, six or seven years old when I said yes to Jesus. My dad was pastoring a church of God in Titusville, Pennsylvania. But there came that moment that I said yes to God. And maybe you've done the same. And you know, that's where our faith journey began. In that moment, again, 
at that moment of salvation, one of the greatest miracles in life. It's that moment where we literally go from death to resurrected life. We go from darkness to life. You see, that's why I've entitled this message today, hopefully to encourage you that anything is possible with God because he's a God that saves us from hell. He's a God that gives us a, good, a new life. Do you realize there is nothing that he can't do? Man, your salvation happened in a moment. And that moment began to send you, set you on a dynamic faith journey. But I want to tell you something. Our level of faith can change. Sometimes it rises and falls. Sometimes our faith can grow or sh shrink. It can increase or decrease. Why? Because you know what? We've got to feed our faith. Let me say that again. We have to feed our faith. What grows our faith? Let me tell you something. If you neglect your faith, your, your faith's going to be pretty small and, and weak. We have to feed it. You see, if we have weak faith, there's not a whole lot we can do. Again, faith has to be watered, nurtured, talking to God, being in his word, coming to church, being around other believers. You see, the world is an unbelieving world. And they're not friendly to the path of faith. And they have no desire to walk the walk of faith. So my friend, be careful. You know, be in the world, the Bible says, but not of the world. I'm here to tell you, when you're disappointed, brokenhearted, going through despair and discouragement, the world's not going to help nurture your journey of faith. So... Let me, let me even throw this out. You, you know what discouragement is? Discouragement is the temporarily, temporarily loss of perspective. I'm going to say that again because my tongue got tied up there a little bit. Discouragement is the temporary loss of perspective. Do you know how I know that's true? Because when you've gone through something, when you've gone through some discouraging times, you know, I can take you to places, maybe sometimes even exact locations, where my perspective shifted, where I came back and thought, man, you know, this, this hasn't helped nurture my faith. But I can also take you to places where worship services or certain times and places where the Spirit really nurtured me and filled my heart and began to move in my life. And, and especially in those moments, sometimes even restoring my faith again, We've got to go back to nurturing, trusting, allowing God to work in us. You see, as people of faith, again, we have to feed our faith. And we feed our faith by coming back to Jesus. Because faith levels come from, again, what you're feeding on. If you have a steady diet of negativity and doubt and discouragement, you're not going to have strong faith. <laughs> If you, if you pull out your phone right now and you look at your screen time, do you realize it will reveal what you've been feeding yourself on? Just go to your search history. It, it will reveal what you're seeking. I heard a preacher recently say, one of our biggest problems today is we're more connected to our phones than we're connected to Christ. Do you say amen to that? I don't know if you realize what the constant bombardment of negativity and fear does to our hearts. Again, we're under such pressure to keep up with everything that's going on in the world. And you know what? We're really not obligated to keep up with everything. We just think that. I think that's one of the lies of the devil. You see, I'm only obligated to keep up with my relationship with God, loving God and loving his people. I'm, I'm obligated to that one that says anything is pa possible in a world where everything is wrong. You see, like I said, sometimes discouragement can change our, our focus. It, it can change us from faith to fear. But I'm here to tell you anything is possible. Listen, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in the 
political landscape that is before us. Our hope is not in the government of Washington, D.C., and I'm not talking against them. I'm just saying our hope is in Jesus Christ in heaven. It's in the maker of heaven and earth. It's, a, it's in the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus came to teach us that he's the only way, and he's worthy of our love, our respect, our faith, our allegiance. He's the one that we need to put our trust in. Do you remember what his invitation was in the scripture? It was simply two words, follow me. In other words, put your trust in me. When the disciples followed Jesus, they saw through his life truly that anything was possible. They walked with him through this broken world. And he showed them that he had the power to make things right. There's no situation too dark. There's no circumstance too dire. There's no heart, aren't you glad of this, that's too broken. There's no addiction that is so binding. There is no relationship too estranged. Again, there's no diagnosis too bleak that when God shows up, things change. The disciples learn firsthand that anything is possible. One of the moments they would remember for the rest of their life was captured in what I just mentioned to you a few moments ago, Mark 9. Let me walk you through this story. I want to show you again in Mark 9 how we can become anything is possible kind of people in a world, in a world that's struggling to believe struggling to know what to do next. I want to look at Mark 9. It comes after Peter and John were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. I think it shows us that faith may be built on a mountain, but it's really revealed in the valley. Because in the valley, that's where people need to have what verse 14 talks about. It says, when the disciples and the others saw the large crowd around them and the teacher, teachers of the law were arguing with them, as soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder. They ran up to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. Have, have you ever... Let me just pause and say, have you ever come off a mountaintop experience and hit the valley? You know, you've been to a camp meeting or a spiritual retreat or a con conference, and you've been with, with God, and then you come back home, and all of a sudden, it's like you hit, you hit a train. <laughs> Maybe you had a devotional time with God while you were away in uh, the conference, and now you come home and... It's like you're facing World War II. You see, that's what Jesus was experiencing. That's what Moses experienced when he came off Mount Sinai. There was chaos going on. So Jesus comes off the mountain and he finds all this chaos going on. He, he's been up there in this spiritual retreat and he finds his followers arguing with unbelievers. And he says, you know, what, what's going on? What are you arguing about? This crowd keeps growing bigger and bigger. You know, crowds always gather to watch a good fight, don't they? Who knows, maybe they were first century Twitter, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus asks, listen, what, what are you arguing about? And a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son. He's possessed by his spirit that has robbed him of his speech. And Many times he goes into seizures and throws himself on the ground and he foams at the mouth and he gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. Master, I ask your disciples to drive that spirit out of my son and they could not. Jesus listens to this man's heartbreak. You know, this is the one who calmed the water, cast out demons. This is the one who's done so much. And, and so this man comes. And Mark, the author, makes it clear that the medical condition 
was just not one of, of, of a medical, but it was of a spiritual nature. It wasn't just a disease, but it was a demon. You know, most scholars believe this boy, again, did have a medical condition. But as we see here, it was worsened by a spiritual issue. You see, we're complicated creatures, aren't we? We're body, mind, and spirit. It's one thing to be healthy, but I'll tell you what, there's millions out there that are unhealthy and broken. This father gives his story to Jesus. He looks at Jesus and he says, we have an unbelieving generation. I don't know how long they're going to continue to do what they're doing. In fact, Jesus looks at them and says, how long am I going to put up with you? Bring me the boy. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to his disciples. How long am I going to put up with you? You're part of this unbelieving generation. I'm frustrated. You see, they were caught up in the argument with the Pharisees. They, they were caught up in being right on issues, but they had forgot the main thing. There was a person here. There was a boy here. There was a desperate father in the center of this. The, the crowd had gathered to watch the fight. They were listening to the verbal exchanges, probably cheering on. And yet in the middle of this is a father and son, and they're scared. But they've heard about Jesus, that anything is possible. Jesus silences everybody. Bring me the boy. You see, Jesus isn't afraid of what he's going to find. He isn't afraid of what he's going to deal with. Jesus sees the spirit in this boy. And this boy immediately goes into convulsions, rolling on the ground, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asks the boy's father, how long has he been like this? In other words, Jesus was ministering to the dad. He could have just said, be healed. But he wants to connect with this father. From childhood, the father says, there's been many times, master, that he's thrown himself in the fire or water to kill himself. But Jesus, I've come here today. If you can do anything, I heard that you can do anything. Would you have pity on us? Jesus said these words, catch this, my friend. Everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately, the boy's father shouted, I believe. But help my unbelief. You know, Jesus was showing everybody that day, you need to get some faith. You need to get some faith that comes to the one who can do anything because you can't. Without me, it's, it's impossible. So in that moment, Jesus rebukes the evil spirit. He casts the devil out of the boy. The boy just kind of lays there. No doubt people thought he was dead. Not Jesus. Anything's possible with him. He reaches down and takes him by the hand and he lifts him up. Jesus lifts him up on his feet and he sends him back home with his father. Verse 28 tells us after this, Jesus went indoors. And his disciples ask him privately, because I'm sure they were shamed, why couldn't we drive out that demon? And Jesus said, that only comes through prayer. Only by prayer. In other words, you can't argue with demonic activity. You can't argue with the world. If you want victory, victory is going to be by talking to the Father, having faith in the one who made the world. Quit acting foolishly. You could have handled this situation, but you had forgot where to meet Christ. You forgot about the altar. You forgot about the power and the presence. You forgot that anything is possible in a world of unbelief, in an unbelieving generation especially when many of us are like that father. We need Jesus. And we're struggling and we say, God, help my unbelief. And he says, just believe. And, and we shout out, I believe, help me, God. Can I say it again? There's nothing God cannot do. There is nothing that God cannot do. If we would just have the faith to trust him, to hold on to him. I think God gives us this story because this story of desperation. Oh, it's complicated. It's not clear. It's definitely spiritual. It's definitely a medical situation. It's definitely mental and emotional. It's, it's not just natural, but supernatural. 
And it's very complicated, like a lot of our situations. But they're not too complicated for God. In this story, they are forced to listen. They are forced to bow to the greater power other than themselves, other than the Pharisees, the, the teachers. You know, there's one place in your life that you need to go to for power. Whether it's the marriage you're struggling in, it's not the power of a counselor or a pastor. Maybe it's a broken heart. Maybe, maybe it's a strained relationship. Maybe it's not another doctor or another series of tests, but you need to go to the one. Maybe you're wrapped up in anxiety and depression and you don't know what to do anymore. I have an answer. You need the power of God right now. Let me ask you another question. In your mind, is there anything too hard for God? You know, when you go through the Bible, there's Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> they had a baby at 100 years old. In the, in the same Old Testament, God parted the Red Sea. He brought water from a rock. He silenced the lions in the den for Daniel. He's in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was walking with Joshua around the walls. He stopped storms. He was in the stone that hit Goliath. He was with Jonah as he preached repentance to Nineveh. Listen, just read the Bible. There's nothing that God cannot do. Impossibility is not in his vocabulary. I don't know what situation you're in right now, but I do know this. There is nothing that God cannot do. I know I keep repeating all of this, but I feel like I need to get this through to somebody today. Again, you're struggling. You're, you're hanging on. The second thing I think this story is teaching you, and, and when I say you're hanging on, I'm, I'm trying to throw your rope here is, did you notice the element of unbelief? Remember, the father in the story said, Jesus, if you can do anything, if everything is possible with him who believes. But you know, Jesus kind of flips it back around to the father. Jesus takes it back to faith. Do you have faith? In other words, when he said that, do you believe? The father just responded, I do believe. But please help my unbelief. I hope you saw what this man did. This father brought his unbelief to Jesus, not just his son. He brought his unbelief. Are you bringing not only your sickness or your relationship struggle or whatever, but are you believing, bringing your unbelief maybe? Let me tell you something. Today, if you'll pray and you'll ask in faith, Jesus will answer. And you know what? We're going to keep going through unbelief. So keep bringing it to Jesus. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to a mighty mountain, move from here to there. And what does it say? It will happen. Jesus says, nothing is impossible with me. Jesus said that because the mustard seed was the smallest thing, the smallest seed in the Middle East. It's so small, but it grows into a huge plant, almost like a tree. Again, what he was trying to say is, you know what? Don't, don't go by the smallness of your faith. Even a grain can eventually say, move mountain or grow into a mighty tree. This small seed but you know what you got to do? You got to bring that little faith to Jesus and let him grow it through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through, through other Christians. You see, we have the responsibility. We have the responsibility to feed our faith. We're the ones responsible to starve our fears. We're the responsible whether we're going to be part of the believing or the unbelieving generation. Do you want to continue to feast on the diet of the world? The fear at their banquet table? Or do you want to feast on what God brings before us? Wow. 
What would it look like this week if you and I starved our fears, starved our anxiety, starved our worries? Would it mean maybe us putting our phone away, deleting some apps? What would starving our fears and those kind of things like the world? Would we turn off the notifications in order to feed our faith? How about let's go old school, put the phone away and open up the Bible and spend some time in the word and, and prayer. That feeds our faith. Spend some time in meditation, just being alone with God. You don't even have to say anything. That's what believers do. That's how faith grows. That's how faith comes alive. What makes you feel most alive today, especially spiritually? Do you really believe that anything is possible? Do you want to be that kind of a person? Living in a very tough world, do you want to be able to make it through by holding on to him, trusting him? Then you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to guard your heart. Sometimes we're going to have to stop glancing at the news and start gazing on Jesus, fixing our eyes on him, feeding our faith, stopping our fears. Lastly, we need to pray. You know, it was Johnny Erickson that put it this way, you don't have to be able to see to look into the future. All you have to do is take God at his word and take the next step. And that's what we do in, with prayer. You know, we can't always see into the future, but I'll tell you what, through prayer, we can take the next step and the next step and the next step. And again, that's, that's growing our faith. That's expressing our faith through what? Obedience, doing the next thing that God has for us. Or maybe we need to start at the beginning with the greatest miracle of salvation. Asking us, God, would you bring me from darkness to light? Would you forgive me of my sins so that I can start growing? And when we do that, then all of a sudden there's no limit. Remember what I said at the beginning of the message? What, what C.S. Lewis said Miracles are the retelling in small letters. The same stories that the large letters have been telling us and trying to tell us. You see, the small letters of your story and my story tells that we have a God who gave his son on a cross, the ultimate sacrifice, so that we could have a new heart, a new life. We could have faith so that we could live in the story in Mark, the small letters tell us that there was a boy that was desperate and scared and afraid. He couldn't help himself, but Jesus came into his darkness. He took him by the hand. He set him free. He lifted him up. So this boy and his father could have a fellowship and a relationship before. You see, the large letters tell us about the greatest story. I talked about it a couple weeks ago during Valentine's Day. The big letters are, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's the miracle that we can experience. Salvation. It's a forever miracle. So we need to pray to take the next step. For some of you, it's the prayer of salvation to begin the faith journey. For some of you, it may be, Lord, help my unbelief. But as I said in the beginning, wherever it is, your car, your home, you want to come to the altar, come to that place where God is and his presence is and come and share with him your heart. You know, the disciples tried everything, didn't they? They exhausted themselves. But really, there was only one that could do something in that moment, and it was Jesus. So today, I think one of the marks of the unbelieving generation is that they argue more than we pray. 
You see, faith and prayer goes together. Prayer strengthens our faith. It helps us to see how much more we need to pray, not just sit around and talk about things and how we've been hurt and discouraged and, you know, this isn't working. You know, we, we need to get away from the unbelief. We need to have some humility and come in our desperation. Again, come to that place and in that moment, Say, you know what, Jesus? You're all that matters to me. I'm so desperate. But even in my desperation, there is still something inside of me that says, all things are possible with you. Again, I don't want to keep repeating this message. I need to close. But you know, that is the bad thing sometimes about our Christian walk and experience. We have gotten spiritual amnesia. Really think about it for a moment. Have you ever asked God for something and he answered? It wasn't luck. It wasn't just, wow, you know, but, but it was the hand of God. It was a miracle. Have you ever been sick and, and prayed to be well? Maybe you were heading to, uh, to see a doctor and he was going to give you the, um, the, uh, answers to your tests that you went through and you know what the doctor comes through and he says there's no cancer or we can't find anything in other words what i'm trying to say is we've all gone through things in our life that should be building our faith we should remember just like the old hymn he is just the same today like he healed at galilee set the suffering captive free he is just the same today in other words like he was back then he is today are you a jesus can do anything kind of christian and believer are you still sitting on the fence? Are you still letting the world and the devil whisper in your ear, oh, you've made too many mistakes, or that's, that's too big of a disease, or, or, or the marriage is over, it, it, it can't be reconciled, or that, or that relationship with that child, it can never happen. I wonder if the prodigal father felt that, you know, the, the one that had the prodigal son. I guess it wasn't the prodigal father, but anyhow, the father of the prodigal son. You know, we don't know how many days, weeks, months, years he had been gone. But I'll tell you what, the father must have believed because he kept going to the porch. He kept looking until that day he saw him. I don't know what you need today, but I'm here to tell you anything, even the most impossible thing, is possible with God. I don't know if I use this scripture or not, but I'm going to throw it in here and then pray with you. Things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Father, we love you today. I know this has been a little bit of a lengthy message, but I've really wanted to pour my heart out because, you know, I, I believe most people that are probably watching today have made that first step and, and they've had that wonderful miracle of going from death to life, from darkness to light. They've said, yes, Jesus. They've come to that altar, that place, and they have said yes to you. But Father, you know, there is life after salvation. And so, Lord, some of us are new in our journey. Some of us have been journeying for a lot of years. Some of us have gone through some real struggles. Some of us are currently going through struggles, whether it's relationship or health or finances. And we think, you know what? I just don't see a way out. We need to come to Jesus we need to get by sometimes the Christians. We need to get by sometimes other people that are standing, arguing with each other and say, excuse me, excuse me, I need to get to Jesus. That father was desperate. My son is sick. My son has got something that's causing him to, to heal him. He, he hurt himself. And Jesus, I need you to heal him. Do you believe? I believe but help my unbelief. Lord, help us to get back on that holy highway. Help us to get back on that road of faith. Like Johnny Erickson said, we need to just step out and do it. We just need to, to take that step. Even though we don't know where the road's gonna lead, even though we can't see the end, we are going to trust 
and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, love you. Thank you for joining me today. Hope I haven't kept you too long. I hope you have a good week. Get into the word. Listen to some Christian music. Spend some time just in quietness in his presence. Find that altar, wherever it may be. It doesn't have to be in a church down front. Find that place where it's you and Jesus. Amen. Love you. I look forward to seeing you soon.